this is Ben Scott for creativecow.net. Today I'm going to talk to you about how to create a TV screen effect, this time using Motion. Motion has advantages over Final Cut Pro when we are doing things like keyframing or repetition of certain properties. It can also make very accurate vector masks. To start, let's just look at Motion and its interface and how best to set that up for use in a single screen. Normally I use two screens and I would move the timeline, file browser and library over to the second window. Make sure to go fit to window in the main display window. As we are working with titles, turn on the overlays and safe zones. These are to the right of where the picture is showing from the drop down menu. One of the main windows we shall be working with is the inspector, which we can bring up with Apple and 3. There are other tabs which are hidden in motion. If you go Apple and 4, then Layers comes up. Because we are working on a single screen, this is quite useful for selecting the correct element. If we had a second screen, we would use the timeline instead. To bring up our keyframes editor, we press Apple and 8. One of the first things we did in Final Cut Pro was select our main video and place it in our sequence. In Motion, we go to the File Browser and ask the file to be imported. Go to the File Browser by pressing Apple and 1, and then select our media drive and the media file we are looking to create the TV screen with. To import, press import from the top of the file browser. Over in our layers window we can see the video extra market stuff. To start creating the TV look, we select our video and go to add filter, color correction, RGB balance. An extra layer appears for the RGB balance filter. Motion works with nearly everything as an object, which is a nice metaphor for visual effects work. To change the filter, select it in layers, and then move over to the inspector using Apple and 3. We need to move our reds up slightly in our highlights and our other colours down in the mids and darks. We wish to add the noise on top of the video. We do this by adding a generator. To be able to access all of the generators, we go to the library using Apple and 2. Move down to generators and noise. We want the noise to be on top of the other layers. Drag the noise from our library and into the Layers window above the other elements. At first this looks wrong, but with a bit of work we can have something pleasant on top. Select the noise, go to Properties, change the Blend mode to Overlay and the Opacity to something like 50%. To check how this looks, go to Zooming of the picture and set it to 200%. Noise can look better sometimes with a blur, which you would apply by selecting the noise, going to Filter, and add Gaussian Blur. Make sure the amount is something like one pixel only. We are looking to create our cutout layer. There is a masking tool from the top of the screen and a Bezier point tool. However, we are going to use a preset shape to get us our final result more quickly. Zoom out so that we can see the whole picture. Go Library, Apple and 2. Go to Shapes and Rounded Rectangle. We drag that over like we did with the noise, and you must have this rectangular layer on top. It defaults to white. This doesn't matter much as we are going to use the alpha channel of this shape only. Resize the shape by first getting our direct selection tool and dragging on the top left point and then the bottom right point so that we fill out the rounded rectangle to the size of the action safe area. We are probably looking to keep any borders reasonably similar. To apply the masking effect to the layers underneath, control click the rounded rectangle layer and select Stencil Alpha from the drop down. We can improve the shape slightly by creating more of a curved TV shape on this rectangle. We need to refine the points using the Bezier handles. To be able to edit our points, we need to change from the Direct Selection tool to the Point Selection tool. We can also double click the object and then click onto the point you wish to edit. Let's zoom into the corner and its Bezier handles. Zoom in with Apple and Plus, and then if we wish to temporarily use the hand tool, we hold space and then drag at the same time. This can be tricky, so if you need to choose the hand or zoom tools, then do that. If we go to the Bezier handles underneath the point and just drag a very small amount, then try the same above. Use the hand tool if you need to, to get the correct place on the screen. If at any point you can't see what you are doing, then ask to fit to window. It may be that rulers and guides can help you when editing the points or handles and trying to line them up more exactly.
Once we have our shape, we want to slightly blur the edge. Select the rounded rectangle layer and apply channel blur at around 1 and set it to alpha only. To create a light highlight in between our TV screen background and our stencil shape, choose the Bezier shape tool from the top of the screen. Then click around the TV screen on one side, creating a five-pointed shape, and make sure to close the gap and complete the shape. In Inspector and Shape, we can see the colour and the outline. It defaults to white, which is fine for what we are trying to achieve. All of our points are corner points, and we want smooth Bezier points. Drag the handles to create the smooth highlight we want. It may be that you need to create extra points. To do this, use the Option key and click where you want to make new points or click on old points to delete. The highlight is very bright, good for creating the shape, but no good for what we finally want. So move over to Properties and set the Opacity to 50% and the Blend Mode to something like Soft Light. It is also a good idea to blur the shape in the same way as we did with the TV stencil effect. If you are finding the display to have too much on the screen, you can always toggle on and off the overlays from the top right corner. We need lines over the top of the noise and below the highlight layer. Go to Library and go into Image Units. Go to Stripes and then drag this onto the screen. You may find that the lines are now sitting on top of all the other layers. This is a good time to get organised in our layers. Create a folder for our shapes and another for our TV background image. This is done by control clicking in the blank space in the layer window. Name the folders and drag the relevant layers into the folders. Now I can easily turn off shape cutout so I can more easily see my lines effect. Select the stripes and go to inspector, to generator and go to change the width of the stripes. If you want a very small value, often typing 1 is quicker than trying to drag the correct amount on a slider. At the moment the lines are vertical. We need to rotate the stripes layer 90 degrees clockwise from the properties tab. It's also a good idea to create the lines across the whole of the width, so set our X scaling to slightly bigger than the screen and leave the Y scaling alone. By dragging values from the properties tab instead of visually dragging from the preview window, we can make sure we don't change the Y scaling. When we zoom into the picture at around 200%, we can't see anything underneath like the noise layer. So we take the stripes layer, blur it a little, change the opacity to something like 40%, change the blending mode to lighten. Now it may appear that we can see the effect very clearly when zooming into the screen in motion. However, it is important when working with effects to preview on an external TV. To see the external video from Motion, make sure first to close down the external video in Final Cut Pro or other software. Go to Preferences, have the camera connected, set the video output from Output and ask to have all frames and make sure Update during playback is ticked. Click out the Preferences and now you should be able to preview the lines properly. The vignette effect from previous Final Cut Pro tutorials is exactly the same in motion. Just select the TV background layer and apply Vignette and choose settings that darken the image around the edges. Suggest three dimensions but don't blur the actual image. Now I'm going to check that all the layers are lining up in time so that they work across the whole length of our preview area. They start at the beginning and end at the end. Open up the timeline by pressing Apple and 7. Then drag out an area big enough to be able to properly see each layer. Zoom out in time with the horizontal scroll bar like Final Cut Pro so that you can see all the layers and move the playhead to the start of the timeline with the home key. Select all the layers by clicking on their names on the left while pressing the Apple key. Press I to set the endpoints for the clips, 
move to the end of the preview area by pressing the N key and press O to set the out point on selected layers. The final part of this tutorial shows us why motion is a lot better for keyframing and repetitions than Final Cut could ever be. Let's create the white rectangle that moves backwards and forwards across the screen using keyframes, whilst its opacity is turning on and off using behaviours. Create a new layer by control clicking and make sure it is in between the TV screen background and the shape stencil. Name the layer white rectangle. Drag the new layer in between. This can be tricky as it may want to drag into the other layers. To get this to work, just make sure the dark line appears between the layers or you can ask the layer to move forwards in relation to the other layers. Get the rectangle tool and drag out a selection wider than the whole preview. Zoom out to fit to window if needed, something like 25%. Give this rectangle a height of around 10% of the screen. It comes in as a pure white, sharp edged rectangle, which is fine for preview, but will eventually be less opaque and blurred on its edges. Move to the beginning of the timeline. We wish the white rectangle to appear off the screen to begin with, so select the shape and drag from the inside to move the shape off the screen. To make sure we constrain the movement as we drag, hold down the shift key. An alternative is to go to Inspector, Properties, Position, open out the drop down to reveal just the Y coordinate and drag this value to move the shape off screen. Now it is the time to create a keyframe. To do this, drag on the drop down on the right of the Y coordinate and ask it to add keyframe. If we wish to see the keyframes, press Apple and 8 and it will jump to the keyframe editor. Alternatively, Click where you made a keyframe and ask to show in keyframe editor. Using our transport controls, we will move forwards 10 frames and create a second keyframe in the way that we did with the first. Down in the keyframe editor, we can see this keyframe. Move forwards one frame and create a third keyframe. If we wish to move back one keyframe, we can do this using the drop down by the parameter in the keyframe editor or in where we have been creating keyframes in the properties tab. We are looking to have our playhead over the second keyframe. Move the Y position to a negative value so the white rectangle has disappeared off the bottom of the screen. Because we have only been working in the Y coordinate, we don't have the crazy movement around the screen. Instead, we are in control. It may be that we cannot see the differences between keyframes with enough, enough detail in the keyframe editor. If you click in the bottom left of this window, a button that says Fit Visible Curves in Window and then move over to the button on the right by the scroll bar that says Auto Fit Vertically. We now have a very accurate representation of the keyframes and their variation. We can see that there is a smooth movement easing in and out from keyframe to keyframe. However, this isn't what I was after. What we want the movement to be is constant speed. Control click on the keyframe we wish to change, go to interpolation and set to linear for all keyframes. Let's drag the horizontal scroll bar to zoom out slightly in time. Drag a selection in the keyframe editor to select all three keyframes. Drag down from the property we are changing, Y position, and select after the last keyframe and then repeat. Now if we return to the beginning of our timeline and let the animation play, we can see a quick result we have for the movement through the screen multiple times. Move the playhead to four frames from the beginning so that we can clearly see the white rectangle. Change the opacity to 0%. Instead of keyframes, we are going to use behaviours on the opacity. Behaviours are basically mathematical equations made easy. The way to apply a behaviour to a particular property is to control click on the parameter. Some parameters don't work with behaviours. We want to apply oscillate to the opacity. Set the speed and amplitude to a high value so that we can see the white rectangle again. Then move the amplitude down so that it is less opaque, something like 30%. Move back to the beginning of the project and take a look at the animation now. What you are trying to do is change the speed of the oscillate to roughly match the speed of the vertical movement cycles down the screen. Remember not to be switching the rectangle on and off too fast. 
You don't want people to have epileptic fits. If you find the preview is slowing down, then change the render work area to smaller and press Apple R to render into the RAM. If you wish to see full screen, then press F8 and F8 to return back to normal view. Now is the time to give this white rectangle a Gaussian blur with a reasonable value. The TV screen effect is looking really nice, I think, and we have a lot more control than we ever got in Final Cut Pro on its own. This is Ben Scott for creativecow.net. You can check my own website at www.benscottarts.co.uk. Thanks a lot for listening.